Hello and thank you for joining me here today. My name is Arvid Varen. This is the first time I'm presenting at SRECon, so I'm very excited. Um, this is pre-recorded, so I haven't seen any of the other sessions yet, but I'm pretty sure that I will have been enjoying myself very much at this point of the conference. I work for IBM, and what I do there is help our clients modernize their operations, basically help them in the journey towards SRE. I specialize in AI operations, and I have a special passion for chat ops. So one of the things I like about my job is that I think it aligns very well with one of my hobbies, which is the history of space exploration. And I see a lot of parallels between the kind of work that the engineers and astronauts had to experiment with and find out how to do in the 1950s and 60s with the kind of work that we're doing today as site reliability engineers. And a lot of the lessons, a lot of the techniques that they had, I think can be very applicable to the way that we work today. Yes, they didn't use the same terminology we used and they were a lot more involved with, with hardware than software, but that's exactly the period of time where software engineering became a thing. And we had to consider the fact that computer failure was not necessarily a technical physical failure, but it could also be a failure of logic. And that's something that they took into account. A lot of the terminology is different. They had flight directors. We have incident commanders. They had simulations. We have uh, chaos engineering and game days. But things like telemetry, tracing, metrics, alerts, alarms, training and practicing, post-mortems and reviews, these were exactly the same. So what I'm going to do in this session is take the case of Apollo 13. The, it was supposed to be the third landing on the moon, but it came became a, a classic case of a near disaster. An explosion halfway to the moon caused crippled the spacecraft, and the engineers on the ground, the astronauts in space, had to work very hard in order to solve this incident, to get the astronauts back in to Earth safely. And a little bit of a spoiler warning, they did manage to do this. This is not the story of a failure. This is the story of an unexpected triumph and success and the way they managed the problems in order to succeed. So let's sit back. We're going to start with a teeny tiny history lesson of how we got there and what we wanted to do. So sit back and relax. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Apollo 13 followed a series of highly successful Apollo flights, each of which improving on the previous one, and each of which proving a technological uh, capability. Apollo 11, first on the moon, and Apollo 13 was designed to be the first flight not to have a purely technological proof, but to actually start working towards scientific discovery. Now, how did the Apollo missions get to the moon? Well, it's a long journey. And we start off with liftoff of the Saturn V rocket, 110 meters uh, of explosives and engines. And as the rocket flies up into space, it separates into stages, because once we've emptied the gas tank, we can drop it uh, behind, and we don't need to keep on pulling up that empty tank of gas and the heavy engines that it needs. So don't think of this as a monolith, but as a series of microservices each of which doing their own job, and each of which being discarded after they finish doing their work. Once we get into space, the two components of the uh, Apollo separate from the top of the Saturn rocket. They do a pirouette in space and extract, and, and the main section, the command service module, extracts the lunar lander from its protective shell at the, the top of the rocket, and then they shoot off towards the moon together. Once they get to the area of the moon, the two moon landers leave the central uh, 
component into the lander, leaving the, pilot, the third pilot uh, to station keep in the spacecraft. They separate and land on the moon. Once they've touched down on the moon, they perform their scientific experiments. And the again, like a microservice being discarded once it's no longer necessary, the, the lander splits into two with only the top half launching off the moon. They reconnect, rejoin, uh, the three astronauts rejoin, and shoot off towards uh, back towards the Earth. And once we reach the Earth, again, the last component, the service module, that cylinder in the back, separates from the, the command module where the astronauts are. We re-enter the, the atmosphere, open the parachutes, and land safely in the ocean. So the only thing left out of the 110 tall, 110 meter tall rocket is a three meter tall command module, which returns to Earth with the astronauts and their scientific discoveries. So now that we've got our plan to fly to the moon, let's see how we put it into practice. Astronauts train before every flight. They need to know exactly how the spacecraft is going to respond to each and every one of their actions. They need to know when to do things, how to do things, and what's going to happen if they're early or late. They simulate the flight from end to end, and the more they experiment and the more they familiarize themselves with how the flight is going to be, the easier the flight will be in reality. They have specialized equipment. The vehicle in the middle, simulates the moon's gravity while flying, so they can practice how to fly in one-sixth gravity. This strange-looking contraption over here is a harness which holds them up as they walk. The fact of the matter is that before the astronauts walked on the moon, they, or trained to walk on the moon, they actually had no idea whether they could keep their sense of balance while walking. The moon is strange, it has no atmosphere, it has one-sixth of Earth's gravity, so maybe they'll topple over and lose their balance because their center of mass will be different. And then they'll just be in the situation of turtles on their back and they can't get up. So they trained for the simplest possible things from flying machines to walking. And while the astronauts were training to fly, engineers on the ground or flight controllers or site reliability engineers, if you will, were training to support them. What you see here is Mission Control in Houston, where we have the famous banks of consoles. Behind each console is a flight controller or a site reliability engineer who's responsible for one domain. And this domain might be the electrical wiring on the spacecraft, uh, the oxygen supplies, the, uh, the planning the flight itself, the doctor who's responsible for monitoring the health of the astronauts, and so on and so forth. Flight directors would orchestrate the whole thing, uh, coordinating between uh, the various SREs if necessary, making sure that decisions were being made in the right way at the right time, and making sure that the flight plan was being followed correctly. And when they planned uh, their missions and they practiced for them, they used techniques which are quite familiar to us today. But instead of having game days, they had simulations where they would simulate an entire flight from beginning to end the first time, seeing that it worked well so that they knew the right procedures. But after that, starting to inject failures into the system during their training to see that they knew how to respond to the unexpected. And the unexpected could be a simple failure of a sensor. So is the failure in the sensor? and we have to act accordingly, or has the actual device on the spacecraft failed and we have to respond in a different way. Chat-ups, though the way they use chat-ups is different from the way we speak about it today when we talk about conversing by typing in Slack or Teams or Mattermost. They used headsets and consoles, and each person would be listening into a number of conversations simultaneously. We can see in this diagram, uh, which shows no the number of conversations going on at the same time, each conversation was called a loop and would involve a different set 
of people. You might have someone who's responsible for um, for the computer, conversing with people in his back room, his support engineers who would who would be helping him. You could have the flight director speaking to all the SREs. You would have the loop or the that was connected to the astronauts themselves, everyone talking simultaneously. And just like we can move from channel to channel in in a in a Slack conversation, they could move from conversation to conversation using their their headsets. And what they often used to do was listen into a number of conversations simultaneously, but the important one they just raised the volume so they could hear that better than the others, whereas in the less important ones, they will just be manually listening out for specific keywords that they could listen into and which would tell them that something important relevant to their domain was going on. So all this required a lot of training, a lot of expertise, but having engineers is only half of the issue. You have to give them information that they can work with. You have to have telemetry and metrics, alerts and alarms. There were over a million moving pieces in the Apollo spacecraft, and the engineers needed to know exactly what was going on with each piece at every moment. So when they built this, they also added a lot of observability into the system. Margaret Hamilton, pictured on the right, one of the chief designers of the Apollo computer, was one of the people who coined the phrase software engineering, because this was no longer just building the hardware of the computer, but the software inside, the logic, the information that was going through the computer also became a very, very critical part of how the computer worked. Up till uh, Apollo, most computers would, uh, a failure would mean a hardware failure. Apollo was one of the very first cases where you had to follow the logic of what was going on and understand why the computer was deciding to perform specific actions and not others using capabilities that today we'd call tracing and logs and analyzing metrics. So while we've talked about training and we've talked about the, the machines and so on, we have to remember that failure has many shapes and forms and can come from the completely unexpected scenario and situation. In August of 1969, the three-man three crew, James Lovell, Ken Mattickly and Fred Hayes were announced, and they began training together. In April of 1970, they were supposed to be launched, meaning they had about nine months of training to be a team together. Three days before the launch, Ken Mattingly is exposed to German measles and removed from flight. This sounds familiar to us in 2022, but uh, they, had, uh, they had quarantine back then as well and he's replaced by the backup astronaut, Jack Swigert. Now, on the face of it, this sounds like a, a very momentous change. Right? The fact that you're switching out a third of the crew three days before the launch. But the fact of the matter is that because they had practiced for this and because they had trained for this, Mattingly was ready for the flight and Swigert was also ready for the flight. So they avoided an unexpected failure by being prepared for it. The entire flight crew always had a backup training for them, and there was a support team supporting even the backup team, so that there would never be a, a condition where because an astronaut was sick or ill or, or something happened to them, that they could not launch as planned. So the day of the launch itself, April 11th, 1970. So far, so good. The mighty Saturn V launches into space, and the first stage separates from the rest of the of the rocket. And now, the second stage, which has five engines, fires up and is taking the astronauts from halfway to space all the way to space. But a few, a few minutes after the flight, we suddenly have a problem with the central engine. It shuts down. The rocket is now working with four engines instead of five. The, all the astronauts see is the console on the right where we have the five engines and the number five engine, the central one, lights up telling them that it has failed. They contact the ground where they have more information, more computing power and better displays where they can actually see the trajectory 
of the rocket and see whether it is flying correctly. And fortunately, without any human touching anything, the rocket corrects itself and continues flying per plan. That's because the rocket has a computer on board itself, the brain of the Saturn V, designed by uh, IBM. It's called the instrument unit. And what it did was it saw that the fifth engine had failed. The rocket was not generating enough thrust and therefore would then fire the remaining four engines for 60 seconds longer than planned in order to achieve the relevant uh, speed and velocity and height that we needed to have. And you can see on the graph on the left, the dotted line was the planned uh, acceleration. And you can see that after 300 seconds, it drops down. Uh, that's because the engine failed. But then it continues firing for 60 seconds longer, which means that at the end of the process, we have reached where we want to be, even though we only used four engines and not five. And if this sounds a little bit like orchestration of Kubernetes and scaling down, scaling up pods according to requirement, that's because it very much is that. There was a, a crisis in, in the spacecraft seconds after launch, but self-healing, the self-orchestration of the system solved the problem and the astronauts could continue. They got the warning message but there was absolutely no human intervention necessary in order to solve this problem. So it sounds like we're in a good situation because we've had our scare for, for this mission, and we've had our glitch, and now we can continue, you know, and hopefully everything will be fine. However, so Apollo 13 is flying from the Earth, and they want to get to the moon. This little Lego model is going to represent Apollo 13. This is Aquarius, the command and service module. The service module is where all this, the engine, this is where the engine is, where the tanks are, the fuel, the oxygen, electricity generation, and so on. This is the command module. This little three meter tall uh, component is where the astronauts are. And this is Aquarius, the lunar module. This is the component that's going to land, that should land on the moon. In this flight, of course, something else is going to happen. So they're flying along halfway to the moon. Uh, they're doing the various engineering duties they have to do in order to keep the spacecraft functioning correctly. For example, the spacecraft spins while it's flying, that uh, it doesn't get, one side doesn't get overheated by the Earth. And periodically they have to do things like stir the tank of liquid oxygen to keep the, uh, the oxygen levels uh, equal throughout the tank. And then suddenly... So, yes, uh, I know there's no sound in space. But in this case, the astronauts were inside the spacecraft when the explosion happened, so they did hear and feel quite a big thump. So there they were, halfway to the moon in a crippled spacecraft. But the question is, why was the spacecraft crippled? After all, NASA had planned for every eventuality, hadn't it? Well, nearly every eventuality. Yes, the oxygen tanks were robust and redundant, but... The idea was that anything that was powerful enough to have knocked out the oxygen tanks would have destroyed the entire spacecraft. So there was actually no need to think of a scenario where both oxygen tanks were uh, incapable of supplying oxygen, and therefore it was not really a problem placing them adjacent in the same section of, of the spacecraft. In the meantime, things like fuel cells which generate electricity were also redundant but they were all dependent on the oxygen tanks. So when the oxygen tanks were knocked out, we had no oxygen and no electricity. No power for the spacecraft means that you can't do anything. So we have here a failure. Where was their success? In resilience. 
The astronauts had a lifeboat attached to the main spacecraft, the moon lander. They transferred from the main spacecraft into the moon lander for the duration of the trip back to Earth, stretching the capabilities and the resources of the moon lander beyond the two men for two days into three men for five or six days. And that's how they managed to, to return safely. Not because they had so much redundancy that no problem would be would affect it, but because they had the resilience necessary to adapt into an unexpected scenario. And they returned safely to Earth. The trip back to Earth was not uneventful, and there were many problems that had to be solved along the way. One of the most iconic problems was immortalized in the 1995 movie Apollo 13. And this was no exception. They had considered a contingency like that. Not the exact same contingency, though. This is the carbon dioxide scrubbing car cartridge. What this did was absorb the, the poisonous carbon dioxide that the astronauts exhaled whenever they breathed. Because this uh, became saturated, you needed to change the cartridges a number of times during the mission. So what happened was that the lunar module had round cartridges and the command module had square cartridges because no one had ever assumed that they would need to use them uh, respectively. So there was no contingency in place for using the square one where the round one needed to be. But there was a contingency. What happens if the round one doesn't fit into its own hole? Maybe something gets torn, maybe something gets stuck, maybe something um, changes shape or expands unexpectedly. So they did consider the case of not being able to get the cartridge into its own hole. And what they did was came up with a solution which involved hooking up the cartridge with a pipe into another entry point. Now what happened in reality was that they needed to use the square container instead of the round one with this jury rigged system. But, and here we can see it um, in reality. But the point is that they took a contingency plan that they already had and adapted it. Something that they knew would work, something that they knew had they had all the equipment for in the spacecraft. This is mostly duct tape, uh, a tube from uh, a spacesuit some stiff cardboard, cardboard paper to make sure that the tube doesn't get squashed too much, and so on and so forth. But the equipment was there. They knew what equipment they had. They knew that they could solve the problem. The only issue was actually telling the astronauts step by step what to do and how to implement the solution. But it wasn't a contingency that didn't exist and they had to invent uh, from nothing in the heat of the moment, but it was uh, a procedure that they knew about, that they had considered, and they needed to adapt to the specific scenario. And there were many scenarios that they had practiced and planned for. Just about everything that occurred during the mission as an emergency, they had actually simulated either on the ground or had even simulated in a real game day up in space. Using the lunar module as a lifeboat had been practiced briefly in Apollo 10. Navigating without the computer had been practiced during Earth missions in the Gemini program. Even maneuvering without the computer had been practiced by Jim Lovell himself, commander of Apollo 13, in a previous flight that he had participated in, which also went around the moon in Apollo 8. Fixing the carbon dioxide scrubbers had not actually been practiced, but it was a thought experiment performed during the preparations for the Apollo 8 mission. The engineers of the ground had examined the problem, investigated. They didn't even involve the astronauts in this specific simulation, in this specific problem, but once the problem occurred in Apollo 13, they could dust off their old plans and reuse them uh, for, for, this, for this case. The last minute crew member change we've already discussed. Other common problems were changing mission parameters. They had IBM computers in the real-time computing center, 
constantly calculating and recalculating things like how fast should the spacecraft be going at this particular point in time and space, what changes do we need to make in order to make sure that it does go to the right direction with the right forces. Remember that the spacecraft was flying in an unplanned configuration because both components were returning from, from the moon. But this was just a matter of taking the existing programs, changing some of the parameters, running through and crunching the numbers, and getting the results that they needed in order to continue. The only thing that was completely unplanned for was the restart of the, of the command module computer uh, during the flight. Remember, they shut down the computer in order to conserve uh, electricity, but they did need to restart it just before they returned to Earth. And restarting a computer once it's been subjected to freezing temperatures uh, for a few days, condensation and moisture getting in into the circuits. And this is a computer that was supposed to be switched on once and then continue to work till they returned to, to Earth. This was unplanned. This is something that they had to create a tiger team to, to do the simulation and experiment with back on Earth. But even this was successful. So just taking the plans that they had, adapting them somewhat, meant all the difference between improvising and guesswork and being confident that the solutions that you have are going to solve the problem. And once all the problems were resolved, eventually, yes, they returned safely to Earth, splash landing uh, in the ocean, and the astronauts returned. Mission completed, astronauts rescued. All's well in the world. And now is the time to do the post-mortem, to do the mission report, to understand what happened, how it happened, why it happened. How can we avoid it next time? How can we solve problems faster if they happen again next time? How can we make sure it's not going to happen again in the next Apollo missions? All this and more in the documentation of the mission reports, the the NASA speak for the post-mortems, and NASA being a large organization, a government organization, an organization full of engineers, knows how to write a lot of documentation. The mission reports were long and publicly available. As a matter of fact, NASA has a collection, a public collection of significant incidents and co close calls in human space, human space flight, and they make for fascinating reading. So what did the post-mortem show? Well, after looking at all the changes, all the records, all the tests, all the assumptions that they made, and simulating the failures again and again, NASA pretty much figured out what had happened. The story began in early 1969, a year before the flight, when the oxygen tank was being constructed. During construction, it was dropped by about an inch. And further tests showed that everything was fine. They validated then after the fall, they looked at it, they tested it through the entire set of pre-flight testing that was planned. The final test was boiling off the liquid oxygen because during the test they had filled it with oxygen. They then wanted to boil out all the oxygen so it would be empty, so it could be refilled before the flight. And that's when they found a small discrepancy. The oxygen did not e exit the tank the way it was supposed to after the final test. So what they did was, was just use a backup uh, way of uh, getting the, the oxygen, was raising the temperature uh, of, the of the tank so the oxygen would come out through uh, a secondary mechanism. This was not an exception. This was not a special procedure. This was just the second way of doing it. And what happened was that they boiled the, the oxygen in the tank, and instead of reaching 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or a comfortable 27 degrees uh, Celsius, the tank reached over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit because of other different problems which had occurred, which meant a fuse had been replaced. The monitoring system only went up to the top temperature that they expected. Which meant insulation of 
various wires was burnt off, exposing them to the liquid oxygen in the tank. Now, this meant the pilots flying with a time bomb because they had liquid oxygen, exposed wires, and they were very lucky that for a couple of days uh, during the initial flight, they never had to <coughs> activate anything electrical connected to the tank. But as soon as they, the wires arced, the oxygen was set off and the explosion destroyed the, the tank. So a number of errors here uh, happened, starting off with dropping the tank, which caused uh, one of the pipes to shift, which meant that they needed to use a secondary mechanism of breaking off the liquid oxygen. The fuses had changed without anyone actually noting that the tank could now be boiled to a high temperature, and the system, the, the temperature gauge, watching the tank, was only up to the limit that they expected. Because the temperature was way off the charts, no one actually knew, knew about it. Now, it would have been the simplest thing in the world to have just said, okay, we found the root cause of the problem, which was that the oxygen tank had been dropped during production. And as long as we're sure it doesn't happen again, then we don't need to do anything and we can just continue as if nothing happened. But that's not the way SREs work. And that's not the way NASA engineers worked back then. We want to make sure not only the problem won't come back, but that any similar problem doesn't come back. And if it does return, then we know how to deal with it. So they added reliability. They changed the design of the tank. They sheathed the wires with stainless steel so that even if there is a problem and the temperature rises again to that temperature, then the wires will not be stripped and will not be exposed. The plumbing of the tank was improved so that even if it does drop again and does the plumbing does shift, it will still work the way it was designed. Everything was redesigned to be as better uh, as possible. But say the reliability doesn't work, so now we're going to add more observability, which means that if there is a problem, we'll know about it sooner, we'll understand it sooner, so that we'll be able to start responding faster and we'll have more information about the, the problem as we try to solve it. But let's say that even with all this extra information, we still don't know uh, what's going on and we don't know how to solve the problem. That's when we add in more redundancy. They added a third tank, which was not adjacent to the original two, but on the other side of the spacecraft. So that even if the problem does return, and even if we don't understand how to solve the problem, uh, when it returns, we've still now got a third tank which will give us the oxygen we need to get back safely and easily, even if the exact same problem returns despite all our efforts. So all this work means that we've made safer and that if uh, there is a problem again, we'll be able to avoid it more easily. And this is the exact sort of work that we should be doing ourselves uh, when we resolve problems, to make sure not just that we solved the single root cause that we think, but that we've solved everything around it and put in place mechanisms to make sure that we can work better uh, in future. And an important part of this is that while we're doing our work, we're not improvising, we're not inventing things from whole cloth, but we're taking the existing procedures that we have in place and using them procedure doesn't match exactly, we adapt them. So some procedures can be quite general and easily adapted, and some procedures are going to be very specific, and sometimes we'll be able to use them and adapt them uh, in place. Another important aspect is understanding how the system works. Um, in the case of the lunar module and the command module systems, the engineers knew how they worked in minimum power, minimum power configurations, so they did the situation in space when they had to shut down systems, they had confidence in the way the systems would work in this very, very low power situation, which was completely abnormal. And again, they did this, not guesswork, but as part of the game days that they executed day in, day out as preparation for the mission. But if Apollo was such a technological success 
then why didn't it lead anywhere? Why don't we have moon bases today? Well, the thing is that Apollo was an MVP, a minimum viable product that was very successful. It was very expensive, maybe the most expensive MVP of all time. But once they completed the mission of getting to the moon and coming back safely, that's all there was. NASA and the United States and the rest of the world went back to looking at Earth instead of looking out uh, to the moon. And why was that? Well, that's because basically Apollo was a Cold War battle between the United States and the Soviet Union. Once the United States won the battle, won the war, reached the moon first, then there was not really that much necess necessity to continue investing in the moon, and you could invest in things that were cheaper and gave a more immediate result, such as uh, weather satellites, communication satellites, space stations, and other commercial satellites that would help life here on Earth. There was not a technical issue with going back to the moon. There was simply no business value in going back to the moon. And that's something very important for us as SREs to remember, that even though something might be technically challenging and technically successful and technically interesting, we always have to take into account what the business needs are and where the business wants to take us. So these were the lessons uh, of Apollo 13. There are dozens of other lessons available. Um, uh, researching this, I had to really choose only nine that I thought were interesting that I, that I could share in this uh, short time. But I'd like to group them into preparation for failure, the things that you do before you start uh, going into production and making sure that you know how to respond if you have an unexpected failure, the things that happen in production and you have failures and you need to adapt to them and solve them in real time as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible, and the things that happen back in development once you've seen the failures that you have, and now you want to make sure that they don't happen again. Summarizing, if I take all the things that we've been looking at and learning, and all these concepts were just as relevant uh, back in the 60s as they are today, and I'd like to put them as one sentence, failure is not an option, it's a certainty. Be prepared for the things you're not prepared for, and you'll be able to live a, a good and safe life. Um, I used a lot of resources to create this, uh, this session. This is a small sampling uh, of them, some of the most uh, interesting and ones that I think you'll get a lot of uh, value and interest out of. And I have a blog where I share more of these lessons. As I said, there are so many lessons uh, to share from the space program, and our time here has been unfortunately limited. Um, follow me if you want to get an update. I release uh, new lessons every uh, every few weeks. Uh, I'm very proud to be uh, to continuing the line of IBM, which did a lot of great things uh, in the 60s, helping uh, humanity reach the the moon. And we're still doing great things uh, today. So please stop by our booth and see what, uh, what we do and how we can help you. So thank you very much. You've been a fantastic audience.